The European Commission says Ukraine should be granted status as a candidate for membership of the European Union. This has been welcomed by Kiev, which has long harbored ambitions of joining the 27-member bloc. But the road to Brussels may still be long and winding for war-torn Ukraine. A major political moment for Ukraine unfolded right here in this building. The European Commission saying the executive of the European Union with the official recommendation that Ukraine should get candidate status. It's uh, something Kiev has been calling out for. Decked out in the colours of the Ukrainian flag, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen saying that Ukraine has made the grade to move forward. A big political moment for Ukraine unfolded right here in this building. The European Commission, the executive of the European Union, with the official recommendation that Ukraine should get candidate status for the European Union. Now, that is something that Kiev has been calling out for. And decked out in the colours of the Ukrainian flag, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said Ukraine has made the grade to move forward. Building on this basis of evidence is of course a historic and a political momentum. And we all know that Ukrainians are ready to die for the European perspective. We want them to live with us the European dream. But this is not the end of this story. This is just the first step in a very long process. First of all, EU leaders need to give their formal blessing next week. And if and when Ukraine formally gets that candidate status, that won't mean that membership will come quickly. Joining the EU usually takes years, if not decades. And the Commission says Kyiv still needs to undertake significant reforms to curb corruption and improve rule of law standards, something that will be tricky in the middle of a war zone. But Kyiv is well aware of all these caveats and it still loudly, loudly welcomes this move. Dimitro Kuleba, who is the country's foreign minister, says this is European history in the making. Rosie Burchard, SABC News, Brussels. Dr. Alexander Titov is a lecturer in modern European history, Queen's University in Belfast, joins us now uh, from Northern Ireland to talk about this. So this move, as we mentioned, is a step closer to what Kiev's ambitions are. But what does it mean exactly? What are uh, the procedural hoops that Ukraine would have to go through first? Um, well, uh Assuming that it's uh, approved unanimously next week by all the uh, countries in the European Union, uh, this will begin, will be kind of first symbolic, largely symbolic step uh, towards potential membership of European Union. Uh, so the candidate status, uh, previously the European Union was unwilling to even give the candidate status to Ukraine. Uh, a lot of countries, even at this stage, said, uh, particularly uh, De Denmark and Portugal, but also Netherlands and others, that Ukraine in normal circumstances would not be uh, <clears throat> ready to be even a candidate member. But because of the war, uh, they feel obliged to give that symbolic status of a candidate member now because of uh, you know symbolic support. So uh, it's a first step on a potential road to membership. I'm still very skeptical that it will become uh, a member for a variety of reasons, uh, but it's certainly kind of a, a first symbolic step. Hmm. I mean, what makes it good enough now for candidate status? And I just also want to understand what candidate status means vis-a-vis -vis being an actual member that uh, other countries felt that it wasn't good enough for now. Is it a sympathy act? Yes, very much so a sympathy act. I think also, the issue here is that um, European rhetoric has been, you know, led up to this so much that uh, it would be very embarrassing kind of to, to put back away from it now, from giving the, the, the state, um, you know, this candidate status. Candidate status and membership status are completely different things, of course. You know, candidate, you can be a candidate, uh, you know, f uh, indefinitely. So Turkey being a candidate uh, member for... Uh, 20 years, more than 20 years now, uh, and it's as far away as actually joining as it's ever been. Um, so yeah, there is um, 
there, there is that. And um, uh, the reason for, um, I guess, the um, kind of willingness to give it now is, is, is exactly because Ukraine is in the middle of the war. And as it is in the middle of the war, I think it's um, taking any you know, practical steps towards further role towards membership would be pre very uh, hard to do without finishing the war first and nobody knows how it will finish and what shape Ukraine will be at the end of that uh, stage in terms of both its um, you know, economic shape but also territorial shape. So, uh, so this is um, a symbolic state but I'm not sure what, if it will lead to anything else further down the road. Mm. I mean, as you said, that uh, there's still a lot that would happen should it achieve that stat status. But from what I see, that the ascension steps themselves uh, are still to be decided, even though the Ukraine has to has been told to take certain steps, six steps, I believe, uh, for it to either qualify or be granted such status. What exactly is involved? Well, uh, there'll be a kind of a whole series, there'll be various chapters, a uh, very long process of um, meeting certain standards, both democratic, economic, uh, rule of law, corruption, uh, <clears throat> uh, free media and so forth, so all the, the, the norms, judiciary and so forth, which uh, will, it will kind of has to harmonize itself, bring it towards European uh, level uh, standards in all those areas and European Union will be the judge of it of how far it progress on that road. Um, but so that will take a long time. But I think the kind of there are two uh, more uh, kind of more difficult things to choose. So I think kind of rule of law more generally, it would be one thing. And the other thing is issue of its economic um, uh, state, because basically, uh, you know, assumption is that the you know once you become part of European Union, you would be uh, provided with various funds uh, to bring it you to kind of average European level or at least um, a certain European um, minimum level. Uh, Ukraine, in its current state, uh, will require enormous amount of subsidies for uh, a very very long time, and I think that's was one of the reasons why there has been a reluctance on the, a lot of member states to actually even give the symbolic uh, uh, <clears throat> status of candidate member because they all know that uh, it's just will be it's a very large country very poor country which is just become even poorer because of the war uh, that it will take you know enormous sums of money just to kind of keep it going in Ukraine I'm not sure European Union, particularly the richer states, actually have uh, the will or the actual money now with all the new things going on, uh, both in energy crisis and kind of security crisis in terms of um, uh, recovering from the pandemic and so forth. And generally, um, there's kind of um, uh, skepticism about kind of European uh, Union among some member states and so forth, that there will be actually be enough funds to, to uh, keep Ukrainians member there. Mm. One of the things that I believe that European Union also desires is the selection of judges whom they say are qualified to limit the influence of oligarchs. Why is this important and how is it expected to carry this out? Yeah, well, that is kind of one of the uh, serious of issues um, uh, in, in, uh, in, kind of in Ukrainian politics and European Union. Uh, they consider the, to be the, the rule of law to be kind of one of the most important elements in um, uh, in uh, in a country's ability to uh, be a member of the European Union. I think there has been procedures been started before the war um, started. There were a lot of um, um, antagonism between Poland and European Union and the Brussels for uh, po uh, Polish. Uh, Polish Okay, uh, attempts to undermine the, what Brussels says, the uh, independence of judiciary. So, um, and there were fines going to go against Poland and so forth. Uh, so you see that, um, you know, you, the independence of judiciary, the, the kind of, um, uh, lack of influence of oligarchs on, uh, on um, <clears throat> politics and so forth would be a very important step. And of course, Ukraine uh, has been... Um, 
extremely um, kind of fraught process of uh, of actually achieving independence of judiciary, and I'm not sure, you know, in the conditions of the war where you you know uh, president rules by decree and bans uh, opposition parties which are seem to be pro-Russian and so and so forth and so forth, um, you know, would be actually in condition to implement the reform so far, but we will see. Maybe, maybe they can just close their eyes on that and, you know, just proceed regardless, but I doubt that. Well, thank you so much for speaking to us. So much appreciated, Dr. Alex Titov. He is a lecturer of modern European history at Queen's University in Belfast.